problems that are going to be there for them in the next 6, 12, you know, 18 and 24 months. And maybe that means a pivot, maybe that means a restructure, um, maybe that means looking at new product lines to, to start to think about launching. Um, and so these are all really, really tough choices for founders and CEOs to make. Um, it's, you know, one of the hardest things I had to do at TaskRabbit was decide to cut 30% of my team. Um, but that's what ultimately saved the company, got us to profitability, and then got us to the exit with Ikea, right? So it's, um, it's not easy times. These are not easy decisions. They are some of the hardest decisions that you as a founder will ever have to make for your business um, and for your teams, uh, but that's where we are right now. So having that resilience um, and that trust in yourself and the focus on your mission and vision and delivering that over time is gonna be really key. Great. Um, Ed, would you like to dive in with a few thoughts on, uh, on this from a founder perspective? Sure. Um, I think that um, whether you are looking for you know, a, a big fundraise and thinking about going smaller or thinking about ways to stretch runway, um, I think this period is definitely very different than the prior period in terms of um, both your expectations for how long it will take to raise money, how long it will take to make sales. There are some sectors where you just can't do selling. There are some sectors where it is unseemly to be doing anything that looks like marketing. I'm not sure how long that blanket covers those sectors. And so, trying to find ways to do other things even temporarily and balancing the extent to which those distractions um, take you away from what's core to your business is going to be, that's a, that's a pretty critical decision set. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more from Leah about how you decide to balance um, doing headcount reduction, whether you're doing that in the face of a fundraise um, or, to, or to stretch out a fundraise and whether there are sources of capital, whether there are grants or government subsidies that um, you can avail yourself of to extend that runway. Um, but this is clearly a time where you're going to have to think pretty creatively about that kind of funding and, and about how to make sure that you are um, preserving the lifeline for, for the company. Yeah, and, and just to respond to that, Ed, I do think, I mean, you use a great word there, getting creative <laughs> with how you can think about capital. You know, venture capital isn't the only way to fund a business. If you can get to profitability and be in charge of your own destiny with your company, I think that is actually the best place uh, for a founder to be during this time. Um, and thinking about if there are grants, if there are family offices, if there are strategic partners that perhaps you can, you know, create a business relationship with, and maybe they want to invest a little capital as well. Are there revenue shares that you can do with strategics? Getting creative is, is really, really key. Um, you know, and I think the balance, you know, for me, when I had to reorganize the team at TaskRabbit, and actually wasn't in the middle of a financial crisis. It wasn't in 2008. It was actually in 2012. We had a ton of capital in the bank, but the problem was the product wasn't working. The product market fit wasn't quite right. And it wasn't quite right, actually, because the customer had changed so rapidly from where I started in 2008 to 2012, but we hadn't really adapted the team or the product roadmap to meet those customer needs. So I kind of see the same trend that could happen today. The customer is going to shift very quickly. And if you don't have the right team in place to meet those customer needs, you could be in a place in you know, 18 to 24 months where you feel like I may have a lot of capital in the bank, but I don't actually have the right team to execute on the product that I need to build. And so we had to kind of pull back from a marketing and operations standpoint. We had to put money into development and research and product. Um, and that's what ultimately helped us make that shift 
to a new product um, that we launched actually in the London market. London was the very first market that saw this brand new product that we launched with this new team. So I think it is a balance, you know, understanding it all starts with customer needs um, and cash flow. And I think if you can understand those two things really well for your business, um, then you can trust your instincts to make the right choices on how to develop a team around that uh, strategy. Great, thank you. And we're gonna be chatting, we're actually gonna segue into alternative finance, but first I do wanna ask Taryn, did you have anything that you'd like to add to this um, to give a little color for our founders on what they can be thinking about? I completely agree with Ed and Leah. Uh, everything they say that was completely correct. And uh, what I will add is that uh, they, the startup should know perfectly which type of investors are covering their stage of maturity. Because sometimes, as uh, Leah, you, you just said that, that the, the going to venture capital is not that they're not coming to venture capital, it's a venture capital early stage is not looking a startup if they do not have an MRR. So just beginning with that point, all the other ones that are in, in the first stage, like a really, really early stage of seed, they should be family, friends, fools, for sure, business angels and family offices. But they do not have to spend that time searching for venture capital because they might lose two, three or four months that that time could make them uh, not progress so effectively, effectively effective on the, on the process of the, of the launch of the startup. And time at the beginning is super important for startups. It's a matter of time sometimes. It's another KPI that we really have a very, uh, well, we will think about it when we want to launch a startup. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I, we do have one question in chat that's a little bit relevant before we turn over to alternative finance. It's from um, Erin Paglanon, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong. She's had a background with um, the Obama um, administration um, and a few other um, governmental agencies. And then she also has a very strong focus on VR, so has been doing a lot of shifting, really focusing on COVID initiatives in that area. Um, her specific question is on valuations. And she was wondering if anybody had any good metrics when they are thinking about valuations. Um, maybe you had a valuation pre-COVID and now you're continuing to fundraise. Any thoughts on valuations in general? I think that's a really great question because as we can all imagine, there's gonna be a lot of downward pressure on those. And especially for women and underrepresented founders, that's already a really difficult area to be pushing upwards on and getting fair valuations or at least equal valuations. Does anybody have anything they wanna jump in on that? I mean, I can certainly jump in. I can tell you that when I raised my very first seed round for TaskRabbit in 2009, I did a million dollars on a 4 million post. That was the valuation in 2009. Now we've seen over the course of the last, you know, decade plus valuations climb. Pre-COVID, just a few months ago, a typical seed round might be two to three million dollars on a 15 million post. Um, that was my Series A round. And so what I've seen happen over the course of this market cycle is valuations and round sizes have sort of moved up the chain. And so a typical seed in 2000 or today, you know, it be, was the Series A of 2008 and 2009. I think valuations are gonna get pressed down closer to where we were a decade ago. How fast will that happen? I don't know. You know, how low will they go? I don't know. I think the thing to remember though, for investors, venture capital investors, is that to us, valuations are all about ownership and about risk. And so, if you're a founder like I was that had no network, sort of had no track record, I was coming out of IBM, I didn't know anyone, I was fundraising, um, you know, it was a lot of risk to invest in me and my business. At the time, I didn't have a lot of traction. I might have had 100 customers in the Boston area, not very many. 
And so a $4 million valuation to me at the time, I was like, wow, okay, they're valuing my company at $4 million and I'm gonna sell a million dollars worth of shares for that. I'm gonna give up 25% of my business. So investors want ownership. They want to, they're going to decide valuations based on how much money they can put in and how much ownership that they can then get out. If round sizes come down, so if the seed round is not two to three million dollars, if the seed round is all of a sudden one million dollars, they're still going to want to own that 20 to 25 percent of the company in that initial round. And so all the math just sort of shifts down and changes. And that's, that's really the equation that a lot of investors are, are looking at. Great. Um, Ed, did you have something you wanted to add? Sure. I, um, look, I think that there are um, some factors that are going to make this valuation compression a persistent event. Um, one is that it's going to be harder for small funds and even established funds to raise new funds. Um, and it's going to be harder because of their own performance, because of jitters in the market that are well-founded jitters. And also because um, investors are going to feel, or asset allocators, pension funds, university endowments, are going to feel overexposed to the venture capital and private equity asset class. And these are long-term holdings for them as opposed to much more liquid investments like public company investments. So that means that we're in for a set of valuation constraints that I do think will persist. And understanding that is valuable. Um, a counterbalance to that is a lot of your costs will also decline. And I realize that I'm now kind of being the voice of gloom, um, but it's been, and I'm sure that others in, in this um, talk will understand that it's, it's been decidedly um, competitive to retain good talent. And it's going to be less competitive given the massive unemployment numbers we're seeing in the US. Rents are going to decrease. You know, all of those things will mean that a dollar will stretch further. So I think those factors should also inform what you're willing to close on. And the speed and certainty of close is going to be very, very important. We saw that. I signed, I helped companies sign two term sheets in New York on September 10th of 2001. It was all about, can we get this sucker closed, right? Can we get this deal actually done? And the same in August of 2008. And Leah, you mentioned 2012. There was a dip in 2012. I know I wrote something on the accelerators page in the Wall Street Journal about it. And we thought that we were going back to 2008. I don't know how long this dip will last, but I think that um, references to what is you know, market or what your friend got in valuation six months ago or two years ago become a lot less relevant. And I, I wanted to also just respond to one thing in the chat, uh, and this is from Emily Craven, and it's about how you reach outside your network. I think doing some research spending some time to do personalized focused outreach probably is going to be really helpful. It's going to be hard because people's investment criteria are shifting because their focal points for investment are shifting, but looking at who they are and writing something that in the first sentence or, or so, um, is compelling or engaging with them on social media in a way that is authentic to you um, to start a conversation. Uh, unfortunately, I think those kinds of things are compelling and I think that it's going to need more lead time. So starting that, you know, you are essentially now in a mode where you are always fundraising, whether it's explicit or not. So trying to build out that network so that you can access a source of, of capital, I think, is, is going to be key. Great. Um, I want to do a little bit of a lightning round um, on the next question, just being cognizant of time. 
One of the things that um, Women 2.0 has focused on, I know Equals has focused on, UN Women has focused on, is um, really highlighting the various types of capital that is accessible to founders. Um, and this was pre-COVID. We, especially in the US for high growth companies, we live in this world where it is communicated to you that VC is the only route that you have to grow your company. And it's been the past couple of years that um, things like crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, um, debt loans, you know, revenue-based loans, et cetera, have really started to be um, communicated and used a lot. I'd love to do a nice little sort of 30 seconds, 45 seconds from everybody to really talk about um, what some items are that you're seeing that are really successful or that founders should be considering right now. Um, anything from government to, again, you know, crowdfunding opportunities, grants, you name it. Um, let's dive in and do a quick one. Um, I will actually have Anna, I'd love to have Anna pop back in um, from UN Women and um, see if she can uh, first approach this from her standpoint. Anna? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yep, sorry, Anna. We were just talking about, um, very quickly, we were talking about alternative finance. We're gonna do a lightning round. So 30 to 45 seconds um, on anything that you're seeing, anything from grants to um, alternative, you know, uh, debt mechanisms. Um, what have you seen that founders are um, using or have access to these days or any just general great resources? Yeah, I mean, from, from our side, from, from the UN, um, we, we don't um, invest in, in equity and we have some few different rounds of uh, grant making that we do, but it's primarily to nonprofits. Um, so we normally don't, from the UN, we don't really fund um, um, for-profit um, companies. However, we do uh, try our best to, to support with linking up. We have in, in the UN system different type of awards. We have different types of recognition. Uh, we uh, bring um, startups and others to, to webinars like this one to give them visibility. So we are trying from, from our side to, to really um, support uh, women founders and, and women entrepreneurs across the board. Um, what we're also doing through the, um, the women's empowerment principles, and for those who don't know, um, we uh, have it on webs.org, but basically principle number five is really about um, connecting B2B um, companies and um, that the larger companies or those that are signatory to our principles are really linking up um, and uh, understand the importance of having a diverse portfolio when it comes to their supply chain. And however, we know that um, being uh, a supplier to a large company doesn't always work. So we also work with the second tier of suppliers so that our uh, committed uh, members of the Women's Empowerment Principles Network um, in turn encourage their suppliers to do the same so that you can move down the, in the supply chain and really create that um, solidarity uh, for, for gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, <clears throat> so that's one way. The other way is to really help encourage uh, through uh, banks and making uh, partnerships with banks to make sure that uh, women are supported in the supply chain, uh, that there is an understanding that uh, the payment terms of 90 days might uh, be too much for a new company that are just uh, trying to fill the first purchase order, for example. Um, so there are many different mechanisms that we see. However, with, with the COVID, we had um, what we see is also that there's a lack of information and um, we, we are actually working, uh, Diana, who's also on, on this, um, in, in this meeting today, uh, we're working to develop um, some resources because we see there is a big knowledge gap. So it's not necessarily that the information is not available, that the, the support and the resources are not available, but the information of knowing where to find it is not there. Um, so we had um, 
a conversation in, in one country with one of the ministers with women founders that were saying, uh, we don't even know how to file for bankruptcy if we need to. We don't know how to approach the bank these days. So there is a, a big gap of information and knowledge on who to turn to and how to do that. And I think that the this kind of conversations today can really help fill those information gaps and, and really help uh, women founders to, to find the, the right place to go. And women to Great. of course, is one of those hubs that can help this. Thank you. Great, thanks, Anna. Um, really quickly from our other panelists, um, Taryn, I don't know if you're seeing anything, you know, a quick, you know, bullet point list of any resources that you think are great in this realm. Yeah, actually, uh, to, to just uh, to comment about what Anna said, the reason why we built up Impulse for Women was because the lack that we realized that it was between the female entrepreneurs coming to investors and also as an investor, where were the females? Because in, in technology, we're talking. And that was the reason why we decided to develop this, this, this project. And uh, it's true that it's very difficult, but also the mindset of the female is much more holistic. We're not going only thinking about finance. That's a problem. We're all thinking in finance and strategy and marketing in a lot of things at the same time. And we don't give this so much um, pressure or uh, we are not thinking only about the money actually that's the problem but doesn't matter where we're coming from yeah it doesn't matter the, the 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 country the religion anything it's a matter of females is the way that we are constructor thank you great thanks um ed or leah do you want to pop in on this as well we could probably do an entire panel on just this question alone yes uh, maybe we should <laughs> So quick things, bootstrap, bootstrap, bootstrap. <laughs> I mean, now is the time to bootstrap. Um, I maxed out credit cards. Like you just gotta do what you can do. Uh, I wish I could say there were resources through like bank loans or something, but what we're seeing is that it's tough to get bank loans right now too if you don't have the equity coming in with it. And banks are so overwhelmed by, um, at least here in the US, the government uh, PPP loans that they're not even looking at the debt side of things right now. Um, and so, you know, we've had some success with some early stage companies um, getting the PPP loans here in the US. Um, but other than that, I'd say you just gotta run lean and bootstrap. Great. Add anything on your end? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll speak only about the government programs. Um, just be cautious. They're, uh, they're technical. They get enforced in interesting ways after. Um, and uh, just you know, be, be thoughtful about them and keep great records. The PPP loan program has been a hot mess and yesterday got messier. So um, we've written a lot about that and spent an inordinate amount of time. And it, it seems like the government has gotten the money into uh, the wrong hands and is kind of admitting that, it's, um, that it has messed that up. The concept of bootstrapping is, is great if you can, if you can do it, um, not, you know, not, always, not always easy, but there are programs that have less kind of residual carrying cost than the PPP loan program. Great. Um, let's do one more quick um, lightning round as well. We have touched on this question on, uh, sort of intermittently during this conversation, but if the three of you want to do a quick rundown of maybe the top three or four things that founders should be doing to prepare themselves um, whether it be um, for investing, whether it be, again, like bootstrapping, just don't even think about it, team cutting, but what is going to set them up for the best amount of success in the next 12 months? I can kick things off. Bootstrap, Great. understand where your customer is going 
because it's going to be different from where they were and take care of yourself. I mean, this is a time to not burn yourself out. We're in a marathon here. Uh, this is not going to be a quick race. And so take some time to make sure that you're mentally and physically able to sustain yourself for your company and for your teams. Great. Taryn? Well, I think that uh, they, uh, things are moving, changing, and we don't even know what is going to happen in the next uh, following months. Uh, they should see if they, they still have a need in the market for their uh, startup. That's the first one. The second one is, as, as team is super important, uh, I will take over the, the team and get those people that they're looking for the project, not for the salary. That's the other thing because they're the ones that they're going to support you and help you until the last minute. And, um, well, for sure the cash flow, but I, they mentioned it already before and uh, to reduce that's what we're all the strategies that we are already, it's in a mechanic way. We are working with our startups right now. Yeah. And also another ones we are looking if Great. we can pivot the business model and actually some of them, they have done it and it was super good because they just turn it. They already got the users and they just have to see the hole and go over there. So it's also a period of education for themselves, as Ed uh, said before. And also another thing is like to get one step back and uh, realize what, what, where I'm going and if I'm going and I could be successful here or maybe quit it because it's also a very intelligent and, uh, and very difficult as well um, decision. But sometimes you have to. Thank you. Mm, great. So, Ed? Yeah. I, I want to pick up on, on what Taryn said um, and also uh, connect it to a question from Lucy Munga. Um, Lucy asked uh, about the education sector and whether that will still be supported after the lockdown. And I think that's, that's a terrific question, but I, I would go a step further and say, okay, which parts of that sector are the same? Which parts of that sector are dramatically different? Right now, there's a lot going on with deliberations about reopening physical locations and about how we send people to school in September and what we do with people from an education perspective over the summer um, and what the patterns look like. And so selling into education is challenging because budgets are, you know, at issue. Uh, I'm on the board of a college. We're talking about, you know, how we're thinking about <laughs> things going forward. Um, and so <clears throat> now is an opportunity to credential yourselves and expertise yourselves by creating insightful, researched, thoughtful content. That will also be a way to um, show that you have perspective on the future and how your business not only fits into the future, but how you might revise things in your business. Not a full pivot necessarily, but what, what focal points are of greater interest are are of greater financial sustainability in the environment that you think COVID will create for us. So to me, the question is not whether the education sector itself is going to be supported. It's what 10% or 30% slice is the juiciest slice in that sector? Why is your company going to prevail? What is your perspective? And you can get on the phone with people who are not necessarily funding sources, but who are information rich sources and create content, quoting them, citing them um, deep in your understanding. If you're already an expert, find opportunities to share that expertise to help others and frankly, to shape what's coming, whether it's in the education sector or in whatever sector you're operating in, but figure out and talk about how, how it fits in. And then my last comment is, on intersectionality. Um, there are obviously a different set of issues that you have to tackle when intersectionality is at play. And we know that the percentages for funding go down uh, dramatically when we shift from uh, straight white women in the States and start adding other different uh, layers to that. And so finding um, places, groups, affinity organizations, that will try to enhance. And this really goes back to what Leah said earlier about going to an accelerator when you are coming out and don't have that, that network. In this case, it's not physically going to an accelerator and it's not spending money um, on a program, but it's 
finding groups that will help, groups that will give you an expansive um, network right away and access to additional tools. And I think that I would be um, trying to make sure that I got into some of those loops. I'm on mute. Um, <laughs> we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, I want to make sure we hit, I'm going to combine sort of our last question also with a question that we had from the audience. Um, Jacqueline Hampton asked about approaching VCs and strategies, expectations, tactics, which is a really important question, um, and how you can do networking, uh, what you need to put forward. Um, I'll start really quickly. Um, I'd also love uh, if anybody in the, um, on our panel also knows um, investors that are still active. I know Leah said her firm's active, we're still active. Uh, Ed, I'll let you speak for yourself, Taryn, et cetera. Um, there are quite a few um, uh, claimed uh, funds, at least in the United States, that are still active, writing out deals, et cetera. Um, I think that list seems to be getting longer as well as we're starting to like semi figure out the new normal. Um, we are, we are active, but we're new. Um, so we'll, I'll say that much in terms of approaching VCs, my big thing, um, and there have been multiple schools of thought on this. Um, but in terms of having literally having your COVID story, um, I'm of the school of thought of making sure that you can answer that question. Um, it is absolutely on every single investor's mind. Um, I haven't spoken to a single investor who hasn't wondered what this, what your lines are going to be doing in the next, um, in the next 12 months or what happens when maybe the benefits that you may have gotten from COVID, um, even out, whatever it may be, but make sure you have that story. Um, and then secondly, too, just in terms of networking and opportunities, um, from the women 2.0 side, I mean, there are, there are a ton of, um, feedback sessions that organizations are doing for your pitches. There are connections happening. We have virtual pitch sessions that we popped up literally to solve this exact problem of having no in-person meetings. We've got our third one actually this afternoon um, pitched directly to a group of investors who will hopefully write you out a check. Um, and then also just really thinking about other um, other forms of financing, and then also reconsidering if you need to, what type of um, round you're going after. If you were going out for a big priced round, you could consider doing a shorter term bridge round, something like that. Um, just really thinking about that type of um, funding that you're getting. So I'll kick it off. Ed, I know you've got a time frame. Why don't I kick to you and then we'll quickly close out with Leah and Taryn. Might go three minutes late. Sure. Thank, th thank you. Um, so I, I did mention earlier that first round capital is is uh, looking to re-enhance their deal flow, and I mentioned that because I know that there are thoughts about you know okay in this period let's go to family offices let's go to angel investors that's definitely a, a path and you should pursue it. Um, those of us who were in the downturn in two thousand two thousand one saw that there was a cash overhang where venture investors were being paid a management fee to deploy funds and they sat on their hands. And when they sat on their hands, the, the folks who back those firms said, give us our cash back. We're not paying you a management fee to do nothing. If we wanted to do nothing, we'd sit on the money ourselves. And I think that there is a really strong drive to not repeat that mistake. And you will see these funds putting cash to work. Um, and so they, they are open for business because they're in the business of deploying that capital into good companies. And the earlier stage, the longer the time horizon, they're making seven, 10 year investments. So I do think it makes sense to talk to those angel, uh, to talk to those angels but I would definitely prioritize seed funds and early stage funds. And we are also seeing um, later stage funds go earlier. So I wouldn't, you know, a fund that only writes $100 million checks, I wouldn't reach out to them for my A round, but I wouldn't blow them off if they reached out to me. 
and I wouldn't blow them off if someone suggested an intro. I think take an expansive look at the market, but professional in investors have a job to do. That job got harder and they're doing it by Zoom and exploit the hell out of that. And, and I really do want to see so many more women and so many more people with intersectionality succeed and, and get funding. Um, so, um, you know, if, if there are ways that we can help, whether it's joining one of our Venture Crush events or, or otherwise, uh, definitely, you know, let us know. Um, but I do think people are open for business. Great. Tarn and Leah, any additions? You know, I would just say, I think um, I have a little bit of a different philosophy than Ed, and I think it's just a personal style. You have to understand sort of where you want to put your time and energy. And I spent a lot of time with a lot of investors, particularly in 2008 in the Boston area. And when you're talking to investors, you're not working on your business. And so I think one question that a founder could ask, sort of a, a secret that I didn't really know about when I was a founder, is to ask your investors sort of where they are in their fund cycle. Are they at the beginning of their fund cycle? Are they at the end of their fund cycle? Um, they're probably going to do much less investing if they're at their end of the fund cycle, particularly in this environment. It's going to make it a lot harder um, to get a deal done with them. And so I think that's an important question to tactfully ask um, and can help you maybe pre-vet who to spend time with. Um, and so that would just be an addition I would recommend. Great. Taryn, anything else to close out? Yeah, but Leah, we, we, we normally, I don't know how you do it, but uh, when we started in 2008, uh, we're fun. We started the, uh, we make a pledge in 2013, and then we started another one in 2017. I mean, we are all the time maintaining the cycle of the first fund. We didn't make like only five exits from the first one. And now we are already investing in the second one. In two, three years, we're starting the third one. I mean, we don't, we don't stop the, the, the circle. I, I think that's fair, but I, have, I also have experienced myself in working with investors. When they're at the end of a fund cycle, they do make decisions differently. Um, and I experienced that many times around. And I'd also say now is probably a tougher time for funds to raise from some limited partners. And so I think it depends on who their limited partners are. Um, are they endowments? Are they foundations? Are they family offices? That's really going to matter. Um, and so it's not just the entrepreneurs that are going to see sort of a crunch and a squeeze on their fundraising cycles, but certainly some funds and particularly maybe some smaller seed funds that have just gotten started may have trouble raising that next fund themselves as well. Great. Um, again, we could probably talk for a long time on this. It is time uh, to close out. Thank you everybody um, for joining us, all of our excellent panelists. This was a fantastic conversation. We will be um, following up with everybody with a set of resources, transcripts, et cetera. Um, so please know that's coming. Thank you also to UN Women and the We Empower uh, group and also of course Equals and our um, GEIT group um, as well. Um, we're so glad that we could co-host this with you. And thank you to all of our participants. I know we couldn't answer all of your questions, but we will hope to do that in the future. Um, of course, if you sort of tap into all of our networks, um, we are answering those questions on a daily basis. So thank you again, everybody, and um, have a great rest of your week.